Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I'm joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well. Thank you. Today's podcast is the next part of The River of Doubt with Theodore Roosevelt, book by uh, Candace Millard called uh, Theodore Roosevelt's Darkest Journey, The River of Doubt. And uh, we're going to jump right back into this story. I like today's story, Brent. It's got some piranha. Piranhas in it. Piranha. Yeah, piranhas, little jungle stuff, Indians, like... What kind of Indians? Amazonian, like... Are those considered Indians? Yeah. Indigenous, like Indians. Okay. Yeah. That's what they call them in the book, okay? Okay. And that's what Roosevelt calls them. <clears throat> that's a colloquial term. They have a tribal name. We'll get into that later. Nambikara or something like that. And uh, these are the type of people... From Apocalypse Now sort of stuff. Like, mm-hmm. they shoot poison arrows. You know, they're a little warrior-like. They're pygmy, though. Really pretty small folks. Mm-hmm. Pygmies are odd to me. They're not, like, pygmy folks, but they're, their average height and size are much smaller than than your average, uh, like, Scandinavian white dude. Mm-hmm. Um, different skin tones, like, all that. Like, you know, your your Amazonian jungle type warrior guy and uh it's pretty pretty intense the uh what we're going to read today it's pretty cool we're going to learn a little bit about the rest of the journey so last last time when we spoke about this i'm just going to do one more um update for those who who haven't you know who are just jumping in on this episode for the first time and haven't 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 been following along theodore roosevelt basically decides to go down an uncharted river in the amazon Basically, go on an exploration as far as they know. No white person, European, no non Indian person has ever gone down this this river through the heart of the Amazon. At first, it's just a like a little trip they plan kind of on the side, but eventually it kind of grows. And we're going to get into that today into a full on expedition, life and death, harrowing adventure. Like, like toward t- by the time they get deep into it, they're like sending letters home, going, "Okay, we might all die." Um, <laughs> it's been nice knowing you. You know, Roosevelt kind of takes the approach, like, "Well, shoot, huh? This is deadly. <laughs> um, well, I'm ready to die. I mean, if it's got to happen now, whatever." You know, he kind of just fatalistically uh, says, "Well, if it's my time, it's my time. I'm going to do this." Um, pretty nonchalant in some respect, but he was worried about Kermit, who is his son, which we covered in the last episode. And his son Kermit is what eighteen or twenty or something mm-hmm. like that, young. He's finished college, at least uh, parts of it. Um, he's making about forty five thousand a year in today's dollars, or maybe fifty. But he he's been in South America making this this income. And anyway, we're gonna get into how this expedition evolves a little bit. And what this means, they get, they're going to drop some people from the expedition because they're useless, and then they're going to add some people to the expedition that are uh, priceless, that, that, that have to be there, that will signify the difference between success or failure on this expedition. We're going to get into some manly men in this, this uh, section of the story. Before we do that, I want to remind you, help us out. If you like the content we produce, uh, go use the go to the description field on our YouTube videos, use our affiliate links with mountain ops. We've got seek outside different partners that really help us keep the show going. And it helps you too. get yourself some trekking poles, some sissy sticks. Uh, they're legit and uh, great for your adventure. So let's get into this adventure, Brent. So the way it goes, it's like this. Um, Kermit is in love with bell, this girl back home. And he wants this trip to be over so he can just get back. Mm -hmm. Looks like they're probably going to get married. Kermit's an introverted, quiet kind of person. Very uh, deep thinking, um, but a super determined and brave man. A lot like Theodore Roosevelt, but a lot more brooding and a lot more um, introverted. And they're getting ready to go on this journey. And and basically, Kermit doesn't know if he wants to. He doesn't really want to go, right? And uh, if you recall, Theodore was down there giving lectures, kind of like his own TED Talks down there, s- traveling South America. And we kind of skipped all of that. But basically, he was doing his thing as a retired president of the United States, talking about foreign policy and different things. And he had the, you know, the sort of 
manifest destiny kind of attitude about the world and other things where he's just kind of like America first. And uh, if that makes South America not as well off, shucks, that's on you. You guys clean up your own mess. America's not going to do it for you. But if somebody is going to try to conquer you, that's another world power. We're going to um, go to war with them. So at least you're on your own, you mm -hmm. know, sink or swim. And uh, he's kind of, I don't know, he's an America first kind of mm -hmm. president, right? So he travels around South America, but... Throughout the course of this, they're talking. He's just talking to different people about his plans to travel to 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 explore South America, and they were just going to get some animals for the museum, mm -hmm. some birds, some mammals, capture some different critters with traps and stuff, and preserve them and bring them back to the museum. Taxidermy type mm -hmm. stuff, bone skulls, parts, stuff he'd done for him before. Yeah, and it's you know, rural, it's natural history. So you're talking geological and archeological finds. You're talking about animals, both alive and extinct, like anything that the museum can add to their exhibits mm -hmm. to educate people and make a buck. Yeah. And, and, uh, I don't think that's really his motivation, <laughs> the results, but he definitely is just curious about all sorts of, so mm -hmm. think about it. This is the turn of this is 1900s, mm -hmm. turn of the century. He's going to be able to go out and see things, animals that you've never seen before. Uh, think about it. Like we kind of know a lot because we have a thing called Google. And before that, we had encyclopedias. Okay. This whole time had, I've been thinking they used to, their perception of South America is they've got the outline of the map mm -hmm. and then kind of just this ghosty middle with not much going on. <laughs> right. And then I was thinking, well, it's, we don't know that much more than they did. I <laughs> even mean, today, they, even today, like the True. Amazon is still mostly uncharted. True. There is so much about the Amazon that is unknown. Even and it eats everything. Even the, we're going to, we'll get into that. Everything's either an insect that's trying to kill you mm -hmm. or a plant. Well, I mean like if you or, had a boat or a or building an, there or a native yes. person. Well, you know, I'm saying like if you had a boat or if there was a civilization there or whatever, it's gone in a couple of years. Like you cannot find it. Right. You can't hardly tell something was there yeah. unless it was really big. Yeah. So let's get into the book. So Kermit's commitment to his father's expedition was painfully tested on November 22nd when he watched his mother and cousin set sail for the Panama Canal uh, from the ch uh, from Chile's Pacific coast. Which if you guys didn't know, Theodore's also the one who made the Panama Canal. Right. Ta-da! So they're so heading. Someone should have told him just calm down. They're heading back. So basically, Edith is his wife. Is Theodore's right? She's the first lady, mm -hmm. um, and Margaret is their cousin. And she had been on the the whole like couple month tour of of speeches and stuff throughout South America that Theodore Roosevelt was on. And now he's getting ready to go on the expedition. So his uh, wife and cousin and their cousin is, are going home. Okay. And the thought of the months ahead, uh, uh, the thought of the months ahead of him without Bell made Kermit miserable. Yet he stood resolutely by his father's side as the ship carrying Edith and his cousin Margaret disappeared in the distance. Quote, "We would have both felt we would have both felt that I must go with father," he wrote to Bell that night. "If I weren't going, I should always feel that when my chance had come to help, I had proved wanting, and all my life I would feel it." So he was deeply worried about his father mm -hmm. because he knows what this expedition is really about entails. He had worked on the railroad where they tried to punch railroads through South America, through the Amazon. The problem with it was the jungle's the jungle. It's a nightmare. And then the native people killed everyone on the railroad. And so they had a hard time doing that. Plus they all fought malaria and other diseases that were nonstop or they get parasites and things that would really wreak havoc on, on their health. <clears throat> so he knows what this trip could be like. And he knows his father's getting up on age. What is he? 54, I think on this journey. Yeah. 50s plus. And, uh, and he's, fit, he's been a strong man his whole life, but this is a whole nother level of danger they're embarking on. So here he goes into the wilderness with his father. So he bids goodbye to his mother and his cousin. Now we're going to get into, what happens next, which is <clears throat> we're going to read about Colonel Candido Rondo. Candido. Candido Rond Rondon. 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 So um, he ends up being, he's an interesting character. He's a unique dude. Well, let's, let's just he get. He sounds like someone from Star Wars. He's a little scary. 
Uh, he's a little. Grando. He is. This is movie worthy stuff, right? All right. You can't make this stuff up. In the morning of December 12, 1913, Colonel Candi- Candido Rondon, five feet three inches tall, with dark skin, a shock of black, slightly graying hair, and a ramrod straight posture, was looking crisp and starched in his dress whites as he anxious, anxiously paced the deck of the Nyoyak, uh, a shallow river streamer that was anchored at the juncture of Paraguay and Apa rivers on Brazil's southern border. Peering into the distance, Rondon searched for a column of smoke, a tall steel mast, anything that would herald the arrival of the Adolfo Rick, basically Paraguayan president's gunboat yacht that was carrying Theodore Roosevelt to meet him. After two months in South America, Roosevelt had finally completed his official duties and could now devote himself entirely to his long-anticipated expedition into the Amazon. So remote was the region he had agreed to explore, however, that even getting to the River of Doubt would require a journey of at least two more months. So basically, Brent, they got to, just to get to the head of the river that they're going to float down, it's a two-month journey through the jungle. Have you ever camped for 14 days straight? No, not even close. Yeah, now (laughs) imagine two months in the jungle, first by boat and then on muleback. Uh, Crossing into Brazil on the broad Paraguay River, Roosevelt and his men would continue upstream as far as possible, disembarking at a telegraph station and frontier town town called Tapirapoan. They would then make their way across 400 miles of the Brazilian highlands, passing through open plains, scrub forest, barren desert, and dense jungle to reach the river and launch their boats down its black, fast-moving waters. With the very with every mile of this journey, the expedition would be moving f- farther from populated areas and closer to the unknown. Although the initial leg of boat travel offered a last opportunity for relative comfort and safety, the grueling overland journey would take them well past the frontier of settled lands and into dangerous wilderness regions where the first outposts of military and governmental authority had only recently been established and where harsh terrain and fierce indigenous tribes still posed a grave threat to intruders. Even for the most hardened, ambitious Brazilian frontiersmen, the territory that Roosevelt was planning, was preparing to cross was considered too difficult and dangerous to settle or explore. Indeed, except for indigenous tribesmen, only a handful of men in the history of Brazil had ever reached the headwaters of the River of Doubt and survived to tell the tale. Those men had been led by Candido Rondon. There you have it. So I'm reading from the book, uh, The River of Doubt. Theodore Roosevelt's Darkest Journey. That's what today's podcast is going to be about. And we're going to get into this journey uh, just to get you up to speed. Basically, you can go back and listen to the earlier podcasts we've done on this book. But right now, basically, Theodore has finished a tour of South America. It's a speaking tour. Now he is getting ready to go on a expedition down an unknown river that no one's ever been down and lived to tell the tale, let alone got to the headwaters of the river, which is where they got to go. It's a two month journey just to get to the river. Then you got to float the river. This is where we're, we're jumping in. The, the people on the expedition have changed over time. And Theodore Roosevelt's son, Kermit is now on the expedition along with a whole host of other folks. This Colonel Rondon got added to the journey because Basically, the governments down there that were kind of hosting Theodore Roosevelt and, ho- and helping him do, the, do these events and the museum that's helping the, the Museum of Natural History that's also helping to pay for the, the expedition, they've all kind of played a role. But as Theodore got deeper and deeper into the plans, the more they kind of grew out of control as they planned and planned and planned and talked to different people. They were like, you know what would be really cool? They float a river no one's been down. So it's grown into this thing where um, it's what started out as sort of just a more, you know, well, it's a known route. It still had its dangers, but it was a known route where people have been before, mm-hmm. where it's settled. You have some civilization up next to some wilder frontier country, but you're still on the edge. You're still within civilization. You're not in the heart mm-hmm. of the frontier of the wilds of the wilderness. Well, Theodore is sitting there and they're talking about this trip down the river of doubt where no one has been before. And Theodore's like, you know what, man? And think about this from my perspective or another hunter, right? There's a quote. I couldn't find it in the book. 
today, but it's in the book where Theodore says, basically, look, man, if you're on a guided hunt and someone's taking you Mm -hmm. and everybody already knows how to get there and that person has got all your supplies and has routed everything and, you know, you're not charging into any new country, you're not going off the beaten path, if you're kind of just a guy that's there while everyone else plans it and does it and has the experience, then he's like, then you really didn't do anything. You were just a guy that was there. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) he's like, I don't want to be a guy that's just there. I want to break new ground. I want to be someone that achieves something that I can either, you know, hang my hat on or fail on, but it's all me. Mm -hmm. So he sort of, over time, he talks himself into something that's quite dangerous and uh, that most people don't survive or return from. And he kind of takes a fatalistic approach to it. He's like, you know what? If I die, I die, I guess. But I'm here and I'm going to do it. And the, the only thing he's worried about is Kermit. He actually didn't really want his son to come along, but he kind of wanted his son to come along mm-hmm. because his son's a badass. And He's uh, introverted, kind of broody, kind of quiet, but he's a very resourceful and determined man. He Remember how he fell like, I don't know, 80 feet or something mm-hmm. off a bridge thing, tumbled down the they mountain. trying to build a bridge for the Knocked train. his teeth out and got up and was like, oh, well, cool. I didn't die. And back to business, you know, he's a tough, tough guy. <clears throat> and he proves so on this journey. Well, the government decides to send this Colonel Rondone, which is what we're about to read about now. And, and, uh, this is going to, this is going to help paint a picture for the journey ahead and the past and set, set the time that we're in right now. So I think you're going to, you're going to like this. Uh, all right. So continuing to the book, it says Rondon commissions expedition into the Brazilian interior, uh, were infamous. So uh, he's like a Colonel and he's, he's employed by the government to put in railroads and telegraphs and well, basically what does he have to do? He has to go into the jungle and try to put up telegraphs and railroads and his men get shot and killed and murdered all the time by the natives and Rondon won't let them fight back. So basically you die rather than fight back against an Indian. It's like pure peace. Why can't you fight back? Cause they don't know any better. Rondon's Um, a traitor. (laughs) So, look, this is a steep... Yeah, let me just read it to you, okay? Okay, hold on. Let me just read it to you. If someone's flinging arrows at you, they kind of lose a little bit of that innocence approach. He's kind of got this missionary attitude a little bit, like, you know, pacifist at all costs, and if you die, you die. Roosevelt's not built like that, so yeah, there's no, going to be a little clash. am I, dude. <laughs> if someone steps out of line, sometimes you got to smack them. Okay, so rondon has taken hundreds and hun- thousands of men into the wilderness to do these things to die and i think they get paid seven times the amount that any other n- normal commission gets paid to go work because they die because they die because he doesn't have to really pay it out yeah. so um sure i'll give you seven times the amount wink, so wink. like i said his expeditions into the brazilian interior into the heart of the amazon <laughs> were infamous not famous infamous At best, they were long, exhausting, lonely treks through unfamiliar territory. At worst, they were terrifying forced marches that subjected the soldiers to disease, starvation, and relentless Indian attacks. Rondon was supposed to have between 100 and 150 men for his expeditions, but he rarely had a full unit. In 1900, Rondon began an expedition with 81 men. By the end of the year, only 30 were left. Of the missing, 17 had deserted. And the rest were either hospitalized or dead. Time passed and Rondon gained more experience, but the conditions under which his men labored did not improve. In 1903, only 55 men returned from an expedition that had begun with 100. Assignment to Rondon's unit became a punishment, reserved for those enlisted men who had proved themselves to be lazy, violent, or frequently both. Many of his men were recruited directly from Rio de Janeiro's prisons. Had they known what hardship they would face on one of Rondon's expeditions, most of them would have likely begged to remain in jail. (laughs) All right. So you're talking about two thirds. This is like less than 50% chance of survival on one of his expeditions, at least 50% on some uh, where he leaves with a hundred and only 50 return or that one where he left with a hundred and only like, what was it? 35 or something make it. So, Yeah, only 30 were left, starting with 81 men. 
So, um, you, you know. Anyway, he slices it. The man's pulling F grades all the time. What's up with that? Why are they, why are they keeping him around? The most harrowing trip that Rondon's men had endured was in 1909, the year that their commander discovered the River of Doubt. This is the river that mm-hmm. Theodore is starting talking about floating down. He had started out in early June of that year from Tapirapoan, the same town that would serve as the launching point for Roosevelt's overland journey, with 42 men, including two Indian guides, a supply train of 500 oxen and 160 mules. Brent, 500 oxen and 160 mules was supposed to meet him at the next telegraph station, Jerenua, but only 40 animals survived the journey. So did you hear what, that? Wh- 500 they- oxen and 160 mules. How many made the journey? You know, if I was them pygmies, I'd quit shooting those 40 guys. animals. Just become, you know, some aboriginal <laughs> cattle rustlers. A few days later, the expedition's geologist and its pharmacist, a, uh, as well as several military recruits and civilian workers, had to be sent back because they were too sick to travel any further. Rondon himself was so ill with malaria that the expedition's doctor finally convinced him to ride on an ox. After riding just a quarter of a mile, however, he insisted on walking with his men, explaining later that with every step, my self-respect was reduced a little more. Hmm. In early August, the men struggling through a dense tangled jungle that Rondon described as monstrously fecund stumbled upon a strange twisting stream. In some places, the stream plunged underground. In others, it, spe- it spread out to nearly 40 feet in width. It seemed to flow in a, in a general north, northwestern uh, direction, but it twisted so wildly that it was impossible to be sure where it would lead. After following it briefly, the men, their provisions perilously low, gave up. They had neither the strength nor the time to solve the mystery of the river, prompting Rondon to christen it Rio de Duvada the river of doubt. As the men hacked their way through the deepening jungle, their suffering began in full force. By late August, they had exhausted all their supplies and were surviving on Brazil nuts, hearts of palm, wild honey, and an occasional fish. The rivers teemed with piranha, but they sliced through the men's fishing line and hooks with knife blade teeth. So difficult were they to catch that out of desperation, one lieutenant, a a man named Pyrenius, finally threw dynamite into a pond above a waterfall. As he splashed through the water below, eagerly gathering his spoils, he made the mistake of holding a piranha in his mouth while his hands were busy scooping up others. The fish had, a, had uh, at first been stunned by the dynamite and so lay slack between his teeth, but as soon as it recovered, it attacked. Before Pyrenius had time to react, the piranha had taken a bite out of his tongue. He would have bled to death had the expedition's doctor not staunched the wound with moss. (sighs) Like, (laughs) some people's, like, how... Don't put a piranha in your mouth that's not dead. Don't put anything you find in the Amazon in your mouth. Like... Until you've cooked it under a fire, 190 degrees. Unless the head's gone, don't put an animal in your mouth. Like... Phineas got what he deserved. Pyrenius. Pi- pi- whatever. <laughs> Not the smartest tool in the shed. Yeah, you can imagine he put, I think he put it head first. He would have had to too. put it head first. Like, why not the tail or the side or whatever? I mean, I'd not always. Only that. Have you looked at a piranha's face? <laughs> I know. It looks like a m- basically, evil monster. Basically, it bites his tongue, the whole front half of his tongue off, and he's bleeding to death. Gosh. Because the tongue is gone, and so they've got to put the. Uh, they, it says the the doctor puts moss on it, and it was able to staunch the blood. What on um, earth was he thinking? But um, so you can see how this journey through the jungle is brutal. Uh, it's not. We tend to think that. Hold oh, on. I think they they might have to take some responsibility here. If you're shaking a piranha in your mouth and you come back saying it was so tough, <laughs> that's your fault. Yeah. Well. What you'll find later is even though the Amazon seems like a jungle and so there's just life everywhere, it's actually deadly silent. And really? No birds? Eerily silent. And you have a hard time finding anything to hunt or anything alive. That's it's not because an insect. It's like 98% predator. Yeah, totally. It's a, it's a, it is a deadly, deadly 
place where things don't live very long, mm -hmm. you know, before Especially they're snatched by something else that it's such a competitive environment for, for uh, food and survival. So we, t so we underestimate the jungle thinking it's this abundant place of just walking around and grabbing coconuts and whatever. And you just, all the food is plenty, but it's not like that. It's, it's just a lot different than people think it is. By the time the expedition emerged from the jungle in late December in 1909, Brent, the men who were still alive were so weak that many of them could hardly crawl. All of them had parasitic insects wriggling under their skin. Ooh. Those who were not completely naked were wearing only rags, and all were on the brink of starvation. How did they lose their clothes? However, over the course of 237 days, they had covered 600 miles of unmapped territory. And Rondon took great satisfaction in the tremendous leap forward that he and his men had made toward the understanding of Brazil's mysterious interior. Then he set about planning his next expedition. I'm just... Uh, you want to go with Rondon? No. <laughs> uh, so Where did their clothes go? So he, Why are they walking back half naked? So the government ends up having Rondon join the Roosevelt expedition. This is an ex-president of the United States, plus one of the most famous people in the United States uh, and well-loved. And they want this to be a successful expedition. And they realize you guys are biting off way more than you can chew. You need a true person who has survived this place. And Anthony Fiala, the failed hold explorer. Hold on, hold on. He survived, yeah. Right? But not everyone else did. <laughs> I mean, like... That's not the guy I'd look at numbers wise, because like, if you're trying to keep the pre the ex president alive, hey, hey I believe me, Rondon's a poor choice. You remember they have a two month journey overland in the jungle to get to the headwaters of the River of Doubt, or at least where they could f hit the River of Doubt to float it out and map it, right? So it's two months from, and this is a ter uh, tapir poem, tapir poem that city. It's not a city. It's just an outpost where there's a telegraph station. It's the last edge of, you know, it's where the frontier meets civilization, right? Some level of civilization. Uh, so they, they strike out from there as they're riding this pack train. Remember, they started out in, in a previous commission. Rondon took 500 oxen and, and what, 150 mules and came back with 40 animals. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they all died, basically. So... Uh, here we go. The men were stunned by the sight they encountered next. Strewn across their paths, settling into the thick mud, were unopened supply crates, all clearly marked Roosevelt South American Expedition. The pack animals, who were still making their way across the plateau ahead of the mule train, had begun bucking off their heavy loads. As the officers in the mule train rode slowly past the boxes on their tired mounts, they wondered what they were leaving behind and how precious it might seem to them in the months to come. What became of this food which we had so carefully selected in New York and which we had looked after so solicitously for thousands of miles, it would be interesting to know, Father Zom wrote. It was impossible for anyone to collect it and add it to our other stores which had uh, been sent ahead and impossible for our pack animals to carry it for their burdens were already as great as they could bear. So as they're making their way through the jungle, I've skipped ahead, they're finding dead animals and crates of supplies and everything for Failed their journey, trips. just like all over. It's like a nightmare expedition already. Okay. And remember the man in charge of the supplies and kind of this whole thing was Anthony Fiala, who was the failed explorer from the Arctic, whose men almost died in the Arctic, who has no, no they got stranded for two years in the <laughs> Arctic, <laughs> two years. It's not like he's like, Oops, we didn't make it. Right. And, Fiala is, the, he's not, um, his, all your experience in the Arctic doesn't necessarily translate to the Amazon. No. Like you couldn't pick two completely opposite environments for which he is tasked. And who is he consulting with? He wasn't consulting with Rondon. He just did it with Father Zom. Again, the, the journey originally was supposed to be more simple, you know, more you know, uh, basically they planned for something and had all their supplies for something that was a completely different journey. Not only that, it was poorly designed, planned for in the first place. Mm -hmm. So now you have the, one of the worst planned expeditions ever for what it was for, for the original safety plan or the, the, the conservative plan. And you're going to now switch from that to this, you know, life threatening, like incredible journey 
and as a, and this is why I'm reading from Rondon's explorations because this is what it is. And and Roosevelt had they have no idea what they had signed up for, and there's it's starting to become a reality. Okay, what's going on? Do they back out? Do they not? Yes, <laughs> they decide not to. Um, and um, as as the trip continues, uh, you start to see over a two month window. Who's adding to the expedition, Brent, and who is not? Who's dead weight? I have some guesses. And who is not dead weight? His first name might be Father. <laughs> Good guess, Brent. Father Zom turns out to be pretty useless and a racist. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Like a full-blown racist. He wants some of the Indians in the, the camaradas, which are uh, just Brazilians, uh, Peruvians, different from different mixed races some of them are part black part part peruvian part indian all mixed right mm-hmm. so it's it's yeah you're it's an army of though mostly people of color mm-hmm. and zom's like dude they sh- i should have four of these people should carry me on a litter this is rough and roosevelt's like what <laughs> are you are you kidding me uh so he's just insulted <sighs> and and zom is trying to talk rondon into you know, having these people carry him and Rondon's like, these men are badasses <laughs> mm-hmm. and brave soldiers that are, he's just like, he's speechless. He doesn't. And, and, and of course, Father Zom said other things, which basically made him sound like he's better than other people because of, you know, his mm-hmm. lineage and knowledge and whatever. Anyway, it, one thing leads to another. And then Theodore's like, all right, you're going home. <clears throat> um, <laughs> And he writes this letter that he sends home with Father Zom. Mm -hmm. Because remember, there's no communications and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he wants it to be clear what's going on. Uh, And people may never hear from him again. Mm -hmm. So this is what he writes. Uh, February 1st, 1914. Every member of the expedition has told me that in his opinion, it is essential to the success and well-being of the expedition that Father Zom should at once leave it and return to the settled country. (laughs) Theodore Roosevelt. The above statement is correct, and then everyone in the expedition signed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get voted off the island. That's hardcore. <laughs> and then he's like, here's your note. Go home. Um, but, you know, they, he still, you know, values parts of Father Zom, right? Mm-hmm. But he just isn't built for this, and he doesn't listen. He's hard-headed. He's mm-hmm. racist. He's arrogant. And all so, human beings are inherently and incredibly flawed, but some just suck. Well, the whole expedition basically said, you're going home and they turn him back. Then they keep moving along and the mule train gets worse. More animals die. And it gets to the point where they're like, okay, we got to ditch more white people because the camaradas, they need every single one of them. They're equipped for this journey. They're the most experienced with survival. They have their bodies are the most uh, equipped to deal with malaria and other diseases down there since they've been there since birth Mm -hmm. and they can't afford to trim down the expedition with that, but they can get rid of more people in the expedition that came that aren't really going to add a lot. So guess who's next that has to leave Brent, our North Polian man, our Arctic man, Anthony Fiala Mm -hmm. and they, they, the Roosevelt really likes Anthony Fiala and Fiala. This was his chance to kind of maybe get some redemption, get some redemption, but he just proves to be ineffective. He didn't plan well. Like he means well, he works hard. He's just not blessed. It seems with the greatest IQ mm. heart is of gold and tries, but he's just not that talented. His, his natural endowments are very low. So Theodore's like he, but he says, you know what, Fiala, I'm going to send you on another expedition. I'm going to try to get the museum to help pay for you to do some things. And Theodore really does want to see him be successful. He's just like, you're not built for this, but I would love to help you in other paths in in the future. And so he sends him home on his own route. Mm -hmm. Right. With a much nicer letter. With a better letter. And then they got to ditch someone else. So they're looking through the list and, well, you have two naturalists, mm-hmm. right, that do the same thing on the journey. It's kind of a luxury. 
Because you, you remember, you're out of food. You have limited supplies. Half of it got ditched on the two month. So trail. from what I got left, you have Roosevelt and you got Kermit. You got the uh, and then the two people that got sent along from the museum. Yeah, you got Leo E. Miller, and then you have uh, George Cherry, the mammal hunter and the bird hunter, and the bird. They're both the collectors, mm-hmm. right? And they decided that the museum sent both of them. They're like, well, we'll have two naturalists, and then mm-hmm. one can do the birds and one can focus on the mammals and you'll bring back all these specimens. Well, turns out that, you know, don't really need both. It, it got to be, yeah, we got to pick one. Leo Miller was a lot younger, but cherry had done a lot, but Leo was cherry pretty, also wanted to go home. He didn't really want to go on the expedition in the first place. Yeah. But now they're in it. Mm-hmm. Both men kind of wanted to be part of the expedition, but who knows what was really going through their heads. But Leo Miller b- backs out. And lets Cherry go because he's the senior, the older one. And then Roosevelt looks out for Leo as well and is like, hey, we're going to get you set up on some cool stuff and I'm going to pull some strings. And and uh, so with a heavy heart, he, he, he had Miller leave and Fiala leave. It wasn't too much of a heavy heart when they sent Father Zama away. But those three <laughs> men are now no longer part of the expedition. Now, they've got their own harrowing adventures they have to go through to get back out. Mm-hmm. How, and far, how many days have and they're all going different so like almost two months two months through the jungle now they, they got to go months two months back, back. yeah <laughs> is that by themselves no with camaradas okay. like a whole army of you know people because mm. i think only 40 or something can go on the expedition um i don't I'll, we'll get to that number i don't remember what that was so they're moving along they run into different indian groups and and they're almost, they're pretty much at the, or close to the river. And we're going to get into some of the Indian interactions and Rondon's philosophy around Indians as it sets the context for this adventure they're about to take down the river. Okay. But they're basically, we're right here uh, where we're, Brent, where we're right here at the descent down the river. They're about to, to, to take their first plunge. And uh, the the river's just a jungle, nasty river. Like, it's freaky. And they have no boats. So they had to get old cut dugouts, which are just logs that have been chopped out and kind of hacked into the shape of a boat. But really, you're f- floating in logs, which <laughs> you can imagine no, not no. maneuverable no. <laughs> at all. No. <laughs> You have no, I, I, I refuse to get into a body of water if I can't see the bottom. You can't see the bottom at all, it's just black. So, no, that would be my final answer. <laughs> Camaradas, let's go. I wouldn't put up with that. No way. And the river's gnarly, dude, like, <sighs> like deadly. Look, waterfall. They know and- snakes exist, they know alligators exist, there's piranhas in the water. Why are they getting on the logs? They said the anacondas. Oh. Uh, Sugar. I think it's anaconda. They have anacondas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 500 pounds. <laughs> That's how much those anacondas weigh in this part of the jungle that they're in. Anaconda and they will eat you. Wiki. <laughs> you can look it up, Brent. Do you believe it? You, what, you think, it's, you think I'm making it up? I'm not saying you're making how it up. How much does an anaconda weigh? Yo, we're about to find out. <laughs> wow, the anaconda wiki is lacking. <laughs> it's like two paragraphs. Large non venomous snake. There's a 1997 film called Anaconda. Oh, that's ho- J Lo's in it. It's hor- it's horrible. It's ho- I saw it as a kid. <laughs> it's I remember just the worst. I remember. Um, Colt made a gun called the Anaconda. That's cute. Okay. Well, Wikipedia failed me. How much does in Anaconda? The anaconda is the heaviest stink in the world. The large individual anaconda might weigh 1,100 pounds, but we usually top at a few hundred pounds. The average weight is 550 pounds and is 15 foot long for a female and 10 for a male. Look at some of these pictures, dude, where people are inside the belly of the anaconda. It doesn't even look real. It doesn't look real. It looks prehistoric. Like these things don't actually exist. Well, Brian, they probably shouldn't. I'm just going to say, at this point in time, we can do away. <laughs> We'd be, the world might be a happier the place. The point is, okay, that's just one. There's also do you see the one with this anaconda wrapping around a lion? 
we're going Go to down Google a, Images. We're bro. going down a rabbit hole. Yeah, I, dude, it's creepy. Okay, so we've established we're 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 dealing with the Amazon jungle. Okay, Brent. So here we go. An even greater danger to the te- to the uh, telegraph line soldiers and to all the progress that Rondon had made in his relationship with Indians was tribal war- warfare. So what we're going to do is go into a little bit of the Indian issues that are potential hazards for them and Rondon's experience with with the natives. Rondon had strictly forbidden his men ever to take sides in a tribal battle, no matter how seemingly brutal or unjust. He's like, it's their lives, their worlds. I don't care what happens. We're not to be involved. We let them rule and and operate on their own. We are just, we're peaceful people putting in a telegraph, giving them presents, gifts. Mm -hmm. And Um, I'm all for that until the arrows start flying my direction. In in utility, however, one, I think that's utilitarian terms, uh, one man had had recently defied this order with potentially disastrous results. Shortly before the expedition had arrived there, a group of Nambikwara, Nambikwara had descended on the Parechis village while their men were gone. Hearing the screams of their wives and mothers, the, per, uh, the Peresi had rushed home, and a battle had broken out in full view of the telegraph station. The Nambikwara were better, more experienced warriors than the Peresi, but the Parechi had a powerful ally, a telegraph line employee, the only man for nearly a hundred miles who had a gun. <laughs> having grown fond of the Parechi and having watched the Nambakara prey on them time and again, the man had stepped into the melee, raised his gun, and fatally shot a Nambakara warrior, enraging Rondon and putting at risk the precious peace he had worked so long to achieve. Rondon's inju- injunction against violence directed toward an Indian, any Indian, for any reason, was categorical. In fact, he valued the lives of the Amazonian Indians above his own life or the lives of his men. Surely, there was not a soldier in the Rondon Commission who could not recite by heart his colonel's now famous command, Die if you must, but never kill. That sounds like a crappy army to be in. (laughs) Rondon's success in the Amazon had depended on this dictum. It was the only reason the Indians had ever dared to trust him. You know what that reminds me of? Remember Enemy at the Gates? When they're handing out the rifles, and it's like, and one guy gets a rifle, and one guy gets an extra magazine charge, and they're all yelling at him, when the man with the rifle goes down, <laughs> pick up his gun and shoot. <laughs> it's just like, what kind of military is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not enough guns for everyone to have one, so you're waiting for him to die so you can grab his gun oh. and then keep fighting. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. The book goes on to say, Rondon's brave and unyielding advocacy of the Amazonian Indian was to become his most important legacy, outshining even his achievements as an explorer. Whatever the merits of his philosophy, however, his approach was cold comfort to the soldiers he forced to practice it. In fact, so infamous were Rondon's expeditions into the interior that he had to pay his men seven times what they made anywhere else. Even the cook aboard the Noyak had known Rondon's reputation for losing his men's lives as he forged the path through Indian territory. When the Brazilian uh, colonel invited the cook to join the descent of the River of Doubt, the cook had replied in horror, Sir, I have done nothing to deserve such punishment. (laughs) Want to come with me? (laughs) Rondon refused even to let his men retaliate when they had been attacked. It was not unusual for his soldiers to have watched helplessly while their friends died brutal deaths at the hands of Indians, and then have no ability to avenge their loss, no recourse but tears. Let us weep, Rondon would tell them, for I loved this man who had perished for my sake, but I command you to do as he did, never shoot. Rondon believed that his mission in protecting and pacifying the Indians was larger than his own life, larger than any of their lives. He would rather die than surrender his ideals, and he obliged his men to follow suit. Mm. Where do you think Roosevelt stands on all this? Um, fire back. <laughs> Are you kidding me, dude? If someone throws an arrow at him, he's going to give him both barrels. All right. Roosevelt, for his part, was not planning on sacrificing his expedition or the lives of any of his men on the altar of Rondon's ideals. <laughs> 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 As a young rancher in the Dakota's territory, Roosevelt had barked 
I don't go so far as to think that they that the only good Indians are dead Indians, but I believe nine out of every ten are. <laughs> and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the cause of the tenth. By the time he became president, his views had tempered. Because remember, when he was in the Dakotas, he was really young. Mm-hmm. Super young. <clears throat> Real cowboy, you know, bronco rider kind of attitude. He even dressed like a, a cowboy, you know, a city slicker cowboy dude, and mm-hmm. really took the part to heart. I mean, he, but uh, then real life struck him. And by the time he became president, his views had tempered. And he, like Rondon, believed that the country's aim should be uh, the Indians' ultimate absorption into the body of our people. However, the man he appointed as Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Francis Loop, made no effort to hide his belief that Indians would never be seamlessly integrated into the world of the white man. In fact, he argued that Indians should not be made United States citizens. They are not fitted for citizenship's duties, he declared, or able to take advantage of its benefits. <clears throat> Roosevelt would never completely shake off the model of the American Western frontier with which he had grown up. When he was in the Dakotas, the battles between the Indians and the pioneers were only just ending. There were still sporadic outbreaks here and there, and occasionally bands of marauding young braves were a menace to outlying and lonely settlements, he recalled. But many of the white men were themselves lawless and brutal, and prone to commit outrages on the Indians. That was a quote from Roosevelt. Though Roosevelt had sympathy for the Indians and understood the injustices injustices and cruelties that they had endured in South America as well as in North America, Rondon's passive, pacifist approach was alien to his entire way of thinking. He was much more inclined to conquer than to be slaughtered. The stakes were rising, moreover, because with each passing day, the expedition was intruding into uh, deeper and deeper into Nambiquara territory, and the Indians were becoming increasingly bold with Roosevelt and his men. Their gestures were friendly, as they clearly knew and liked Rondon, but the expedition members understood that the slightest insult or injury, whether real or simply perceived, could turn the Indians against them before they even realized what had happened. The Nambiquara lived by the laws of the wilderness, which demanded that, Ro- that as Roosevelt explained, friends proclaim their presence. <clears throat> Roosevelt explained, friends proclaim their presence, a silent advance marks a foe. Makes sense? Yeah. During war, the Nambiquara had perfected the art of the surprise attack. It talked about how they would set up for war. I'm going to skip this part. But basically, they did some really uh, odd things like burn anteater skins and stuff, the skin of a toad in holes and just things that superstitious kind of things or okay. that uh, prepared them for war. And hey, they would, maybe they know some stuff we don't. Yeah, totally. Conversely, to show their good intentions when they visited the expedition, the Indians would leave their weapons behind and call out to Roosevelt and his men from hiding places in the forest that surrounded the telegraph road. The members of the expedition would answer, inviting the Indians to visit their camp. The Indians would then shout again. The expedition would answer, shout, answer, shout, answer, until finally the Indians were certain that they were welcome and the expedition was certain they were coming as friends and not as attackers. <clears throat> so it was a little shouting match to announce each other? I'm out here. We hear you. Can we come in? Come in. Do you have weapons? We don't. You know, Uh this is back and forth, back and forth, until finally it was like, they're easing their way in. Like, don't shoot me. I won't shoot you. (laughs) Once in the camp, the Nambiquara would get as close as physically possible to the white men, whom they found curiously pale, tall, and hairy. While Roosevelt was trying to write, they would gather around him so tightly that he would have to gently push them away so that he could move his arms. The Namaquara were taller and darker than the Paresi, with longer beards and hair cut into distinctive uh, bowl-like bangs. Around Rondon, they were smiling and relaxed. Kermit liked them. They are a very pleasant set, he wrote Bell, and didn't look at all as if they had given Rondon all the trouble they have. They have small hands and feet and really nice faces. It's melancholy to think how they will change when civilization comes here. Leo Miller, however, who perhaps of all the members of the expedition had the lowest opinions of Indians, he's the uh, the other naturalist, the 24-year-old from the museum, uh, Leo was repelled by the quills and the thin pieces of bamboo that the Nam- Nambiquara men threaded through holes pierced into their upper lips and the septum of their noses, especially since the Indians clearly had no appreciation for the American concept of personal space. <laughs> No. (laughs) They had the unpleasant habit of coming close up to one and jabbering at a furious rate of speed, Miller wrote. 
This caused the labrets to move uh, uncomfortably near one's eyes, and it was <laughs> necessary at times to retreat a short distance in order to get out of the range of the menacing ornaments. So they Labrets? Yeah, they pierced their noses with uh-huh. quills okay. and bamboo, <laughs> sharp ones, right? So he's like, they get in your face, and they're whispering, and you're about to get poked in the eye by their, <laughs> by their nose uh, <laughs> spike. Don't so spike me, bro. Uh, Mar- uh, Roosevelt marveled at these sticks, which were roughly six inches long. And he, he marveled that they did not bother the Indians, even when they ate. Uh, they laughed at the suggestion of removing them, he wrote. Evidently, to have done so would have been rather bad manners, like using a knife as an aid in eating ice cream. I, I don't get the comparison, but okay. <laughs> bad manners. Okay. 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 The Nambiquara intrigued Roosevelt, and he enjoyed their company, but he would not let his guard down around them. He had heard vivid tales of the brutality toward the Parici and the Utiariti, and he had spent a night watching them dance in Jeruna, only to wake up and find that they had left in the wee hours, taking with them two of the expedition's dogs. <laughs> the Indians were, he wrote, Light-hearted robbers and murderers. <laughs> <clears throat> While he was on his expedition, Roosevelt felt obliged to follow Rondon's lead. This was his country and his territory, and Roosevelt respected Rondon's authority as a colonel in the Brazilian military. However, nothing he saw suggested that Rondon's approach would produce anything but tragedy. His concerns were dramatically illustrated on February 11. When the men made camp near the remains of an abandoned Indian village, after dinner, a few of them, uh, the men wandered over to see what was left. Not far from the sagging and crumbling palm thatch huts, the men stumbled upon the graves of two Brazilian soldiers and an army officer who had been murdered by the Nambiquara and then buried vertically with their heads and shoulders sticking out of the ground. Mm, lovely. This happens quite a bit where they bury them vertically and so they just sit there like dead with their head and shoulders above the ground. Uh, that's a bit macabre. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I guess like if you're trying to scare some people off, but <laughs> right. um, the most frightening aspect of these lonely graves was that the Indians who had killed these men were much further along the road of pacification, civilization, and friendship with the outside world. than were the unknown Indians who lived on the banks of the river of doubt. But this is, they were just hanging out with this crew. And hanging out and all buddy, buddy, buddy and all that. And then they just were at camp hanging out and the Indians leave and they walk over to a part of the camp around the corner and there's two, two soldiers and an officer dead, buried upright, murdered by the Indians. That's not very neighborly of them. <laughs> so you're like, well, he said lighthearted robbers and murderers. <clears throat> um, and his point was these Indians were, you know, they were, they knew the Brazilians, they knew Rondon, they had established relationships, they had already paid the price, and yet they were they had no problem murdering three people. And well, it's not like anything's going to happen to them. <laughs> so uh, it says the Nambiquara were violent and unpredictable, but at least they had forged a semblance of peace with Rondon. The Indians of the River of Doubt, in contrast, were utterly unknown, even to Rondon. And there was no reason to think that they would welcome the expedition into their territory territory with any more tolerance or self-restraint than the Nambiquara had shown when they had rained arrows down on Rondon at his first approach. Okay, still, like, I get it. Like, the Indians down there, I doubt they're going to be any worse than these jerks. (laughs) Roosevelt and his men may have regarded themselves as, as explorers, but the Indians would... Uh, know them only as invaders the point is the threat is real and they've already there's no reason to suppose that you're gonna all of a sudden down the river of doubt find more friendlier indians Mm -hmm. than these right and so it's like all right um what are we getting ourselves into you you learn more about the poison arrows and stuff and and their warrior how are they poisoning these arrows i think with uh frog uh, oh so they're rubbing on frogs not rubbing them poop or something I think it's a, a toxin that is on frogs or a plant. And then they, they, they get the tip mm-hmm. all done up. I think it's a plant, actually. And then they poison the tip. And then um, we'll get into it. The book will cover it. But basically, Brent, they're all poison-tipped arrows. Lovely. With all of these worries weighing on his mind, Roosevelt was struck one last heavy blow as he reached the River of Doubt. Throughout the overland journey, 
Rondon had assured the ex-president that the expedition would have enough provisions for every man who was to descend the river. When they took stock of their supplies, however, Rondon and Roosevelt together learned that the haphazard preparations for the journey and the grueling month since leaving Tapirapoan had taken a far greater toll than anyone had fully realized. Even in the best of circumstances, the remaining rations would not come close to feeding the 16 camaradas who were to do the hardest work of paddling the expedition's boats and portaging uh, the equipment. At the very outset of their descent of an unmapped river, Roosevelt was forced to cut his own and the other officers' rations in half so that the camaradas on whom they depended would, could have any chance of surviving the journey. The expedition had now turned into a race against time. The survival of every man would depend on their collective ability to master the churning river, evade its ever-present dangers, and discover a route out of the deepest rainforest before their supplies ran out. I don't see what the problem is. Just catch what you eat or eat what you catch. Uh, and as you'll learn as you go through, there is nothing to catch. Really? No. I feel like the, the Amazon would be a little dense and teeming with life. Perhaps, if you know what you're looking for. But what you find is, as you read about it more and more, that it's more like trying to go through the valley, uh, the Death Valley. Like, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Don't assume you're going to find any food. Like, all his men keep starving to death and starving to death and starving to death on these journeys. Most of them are skin and bones when they get back. So... If you Crazy. don't, if you don't know the land and what to look for and where the food is and what can be ate and what cannot be eaten and so on, you can't catch critters in the rivers, uh, fishing, all that. It just becomes. It's always easier said than done. It's funny when someone talks to me about backpacking in the wilderness mm -hmm. and they're like, "Well, you can just like, like, like food. Just be a naturalist and and mm -hmm. uh, and just strip the bark and eat the bark." And <laughs> yeah, it's like there's lots of grubs under that there rock. <laughs> It's like, uh, you know, I suppose when you're educated and you really know, but Rondon has learned all the tricks there is to know, mm -hmm. but it's just not that easy to make food out of nothing, you know, or, or especially if you got 20 plus mouths. Like I said, feed. this is not like Hawaii. It's mm -hmm. not like there's coconut trees and pineapples. bananas and pineapples growing off of everything. Yeah. This, this is, um, a jungle that if there's anything like that to be eaten, it's being eaten. Mm. Every animal is competing to eat it before the next animal eats it. So, and it's thick. Like if there is a, a peccary, a wild pig or something standing six feet from you, Brent, you won't see it. Oh uh, yeah. It's a rainforest. It's dense. You're not, you, and you're not sneaking up. on. You're nothing. not sneaking up on it. Mm -hmm. So it's going to prove to be a really treacherous trip. So there you have it. A little, a little sort of slice. The next part we're going to get into they're going to actually hit the river and start floating. And uh, right off the bat, there's going to be problems. Are there more piranha problems? <clears throat> there's, there's all, yeah, there's all sorts of problems. And, and think about this. You got to get out of the boat, knee deep, crotch deep, and you got to like maneuver it through a patch of water teeming with piranhas. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> I have there's this thing called... You know, a healthy sense for or lust for life. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be stepping my foot in there. So the the uh, the point is this this uh, it the next part gets pretty interesting. Here is a picture you can, can't really hardly see it, but uh, where they're floating down in the dugout, and you can see it's it's just a floating log that's been carved. Most of it, it fills with water. It gets and, constantly. Yeah, I mean, it's just a roly poly. They should have got a self baler. Um, it's. <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't bring the canoes that they originally thought mm -hmm. about bringing. The, the light canoes. weight, the North American like hundred and fifty pound canoes that the, were like part buckskin and stuff. Yeah, and they had some aluminum type style. Uh, had they had boats like that, it could have made a huge difference. But think about it: they got to float this river, Brent, and and it's going to go through the heart of the Amazon jungle. And where is it going to take you? Where is it going to go? They don't know. For all they know, it goes north, south, east, west. Like, they don't know what the river's going to do. Does it run to the ocean? And then if it gets you to the ocean, like, is there anybody there? Like, not only do they have to take the river at some point, though, they got to find some unknown way 
out of the jungle. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be another two months? They don't have food. And how many waterfalls? And how many? What, what yeah, if they what get? What do you do if you run into a waterfall? What if they get? Do you have to carry those logs around? I would probably just send some dudes down there and just hope they catch it. What if it's a cliff, like a two hundred foot drop, mm -hmm. and you got to hike that boat two miles around the cliff to find a way down, mm -hmm. and then, then two miles take the back down. to the river? So, folks, if you use code GRITTY, <laughs> you can avoid all this and get an alpaca raft. <laughs> That's right. Use the code GRITTY for an alpaca raft. Uh, it's not even fair, the, no, the, the gear we have no, today. Not, not even, even fair. Um, I, um, I was looking up piranhas mm -hmm. and some cool facts about piranhas. Yeah. Did you know that piranhas, well, specifically, so there's like... A big debate on how many piranhas there are in the world, how many species of piranhas. Mm -hmm. There's at least 30 mm -hmm. up to maybe 90. Yeah. It's like hugely contested how many species there are. But we do know that there is one species that's the iconic one. It's the red, red belly. belly. Yeah. Did you know that they thrum when you they take them out of the water? Mm -mm. So piranhas have, what do they call it? A swim bladder. Yeah. And it's basically an organ that they fill up with air and stuff. So that yeah. they a lot of salt water. Well, most fish actually mm -hmm. have the swim bladder. Well, they fish. they thrum with that. They they um, when they come out of the so they they communicate to other piranhas mm -hmm. by making a drumming sound with that swim bladder, hmm. and so they'll actually communicate and signal to other piranhas. So the whole per, it's kind of a myth that piranhas actually eat people or like yeah are like super aggressive. They they call it shoaling when they gather together. They're not in schools for some reason. It's shoaling. Mm -hmm. And they shoal when they think there's a predator nearby. So they'll start doing their drumming thing, and then they'll all whoop, come together to keep predators off of them. Right, right, right. They get in a herd, basically, mm -hmm. so that you're safer in the herd than on than in They just, for some shark. reason, develop these nasty teeth. Well, they eat meat. Well, yeah, they eat meat, but, like, lots of fish eat meat, and they don't have teeth like that. <laughs> you know? Like, a bass is respectable. It just swallows you whole. <laughs> it's pretty creepy when you see, like, <clears throat> an animal fall into, uh, a, a you know, a pool with piranhas, mm -hmm. and then they just devour it in seconds. Now, they say that doesn't happen very often, and it's really rare. You mm -hmm. usually just have one or two Zs that bite mm -hmm. you and stuff and take a chunk, but they say that they're they're... Their teeth are razor sharp, like razor. like, and it is like getting bit by a, sh a mini shark. Like once, mm -hmm. it'll take the whole chunk out. Yeah, if it bites on your arm, that that mouth shaped hole is gone now, completely gone. Mm -hmm. So, did you know that the? Um, <laughs> I don't know if you're going to get to this or talk about it at all, yeah. but they put on a display for Roosevelt. Uh huh. Some of the natives. Did yeah. you hear about that? No. So they dam up this chunk of the river, mm -hmm. right? And then they, they starved the piranhas that were in there, and then they dragged an entire cow in there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they're trying to scare him off or what, <laughs> but they pulled the... So they basically dragged the cow across this log bridge slash dam, mm -hmm. and by the time they got to the other side, all they had was the head and a skeleton. Yeah, yeah. Like, they had a couple hundred in there, and they just devoured the thing by the time it crossed the river. Yeah, well, it's important to have a healthy... Respect. respect, yeah, like what Roosevelt, you're dealing this with, is what you're getting into, and then he's like, "Jolly good, let's do this." <laughs> oh man, I I love this book though because you know I like the adventure, uh, any kind of overland adventure like that, water land, like water travel into uncharted territory. It's pretty interesting too because you can see how poor planning really, really affects the trip. Right, it, it's the difference between success and failure. It's it's like it's like a guy who goes out and doesn't bring something to deal with uh, a bad cut. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that one thing could have saved you, like blood clotting. Yeah, like I always bring the blood cop clot deals. Like if you get shot by an arrow, or broadhead, or a gun by accident or, or mm -hmm. by purpose, I guess, <laughs> uh, then having that blood clot saves your life. If you didn't have it. It, you could die, right? Mm -hmm. Having the right uh, shelter from storm, having the right gear. If you fell in an icy cold river, some way to, to get inside a uh, sleeping bag and a shelter, get try warm. to get your body temperature back as quick as possible. Having uh, a way to light a fire, you know, different fire starting tools. All of those things are critical to surviving. 
if you plan properly and you have some of this stuff, you know, and you're kind of doing all this stuff, thinking ahead, extra batteries, a way mm -hmm. to communicate multiple forms of satellite communication with you and redundant options there, uh, compass, a paper map in case some things do fail. Like all of these things can add up to the difference between someone dying and surviving on a trip. And it seems like such a small, small detail, but it can make all the difference. And so this story is fascinating like that. At the same time, Brent, they're half cocked, unprepared, right? And they go through this and they, with their ingenuity and their determination, they survive poison arrows and, and, uh, you know, waterfalls and some gnarly stuff and Indian attacks. And you, and you also learn like that sometimes it's just sure will and determination and grit that gets you through some of this stuff. And, and, uh, later no one believes Theodore pulls this off. Mm -hmm. He gets mocked when he comes back from this trip. Other more arrogant exploration teams decide to go and duplicate his trip to prove him wrong, to prove him wrong. And it's, and I basically one, one, Famous group is never heard from again. Yeah, they're just gone. They're gone. And the other group, and they were far, far more equipped and prepared now. Mm -hmm. And the other group, I believe like three survive out of 50 or something. I, I got to We'll find out as we read the book. It's been a long time since I read it. So we're kind of going through it again together. It's a refresher for me. Mm -hmm. But that tells you right there. And others then later finally go. And that tells you though, that this is a harrowing journey of life and death. And that... <clears throat> it takes a little more than just prep. Some of it's luck, you know? And then uh, I think a lot of it is grit and determination. Um, I think most of it is. You take a look at, like, the, the mountain men that mm -hmm. went and lived on the mountains for years at a time. They didn't have a whole lot with them other than a couple of tools, but mostly grit. Well, so ingenuity, too. Mm -hmm. You know, like Daniel Boone, you know, he's just tricky. He's a smart dude. <laughs> he's a tricky, tri trick tricky, tricky dude. Um, but also tough, right? Like, yeah. Anyway, thanks for tuning into the podcast. Don't forget to use the code gritty at mountain ops. Use it at uh, seek outside. Uh, Do you know they made some movies called Piranha? <laughs> no. Yeah. 1978 Piranha. Nice. And then they made a sequel two years later called Piranha, the spawning. <laughs> its tagline is, it started off as just a vacation. <laughs> and then they made remakes of it in the 90s yeah. the one thing they all have in common is half naked chicks um on the front of the cover hmm. apparently that's mandatory they're well, does, comedy horrors it does pique one's curiosity a little bit yeah they're all like half naked chicks on flotation <laughs> devices with a bunch of piranhas underneath of them <laughs> oh man horrors what horrors are made of uh folks thanks for tuning in the podcast and do us a favor um we just did a podcast uh day before yesterday or a couple days ago on that decked system that we got in the back of our truck. We're supposed to put a code, a link up that uh, helps us uh, with some commissions with those guys, but we haven't figured out how to set it up. So uh, if you did get a decked system, because we recommend it, just send them a note and say, hey, Gritty helped us out. Um, they don't have any discounts just yet. They might down the road, but right now it's just a, it's just a product that uh, across the board, they don't do discounts for, but it's a cool system check that Organize out Organize the back of your truck yeah it was worth i think it's worth worth the investment uh use the code gritty at sheep feet alpaca rafts goat knives mark livisace e-scouting e class valkyrie archery and of course sissy sticks and mountain ops uh heather's choice although she's really really low on supply right now mm -hmm. sold out mm -hmm. on a lot of stuff right now use the code gritty at graxaw for some game bags all that stuff really helps us out, keeps our show going. We appreciate you tuning in. Stay gritty.